coming up on At Issue. Oh, I think it's a frivolous lawsuit. I think it's a lawyer that's trying to get attention. State flag lawsuit. A Mississippi attorney files suit against Governor Bryant to change the state flag. This bill is going to mess with education and is going to destroy education as we knew it. MAEP funding formula. Lawmakers move forward on changing the way the state sends education money to school districts. Presidential primary. Mississippians will soon pick their favorites for president. Who will win? At Issue starts right now. Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Wilson Stribling. Welcome to another edition of At Issue, where we discuss and debate the critical issues facing the state of Mississippi and how these issues impact you. And we want you to share your opinions and comments with us. Just go to facebook.com slash mpbonlinenews. On Twitter, our handle is at mpbnews. Also visit our webpage, mpbonline.org slash issue. And you can check us out, MPB News, and all of your favorite shows on our new MPB app. It's free to download for your Apple or Android phone. Lawmakers debated down to the deadline this week to pass bills from the floor of both chambers. Here is what passed this week. The House voted along Open party lines to approve clerk. a plan to change the funding formula for the Mississippi Adequate Education Program, also known as MAEP. Its goal is to help school districts measure up to average academic benchmarks. Since it was made law in 1997, the legislature has fully funded MAEP only twice. House Bill 458 passed 75 to 45, but not before a passionate floor debate. Years ago, when states like North Carolina and South Carolina were putting money in public education to improve their system, we were spending money here on segregation to keep our system segregated. That's why we are behind. We are 30 to 40 years behind because we spent dollar on dollar trying to segregate and keep the races separated. And I know y'all don't like to hear that. We sung Dixie all the way uh, to, 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 to this bank and spent it in on segregation. Now this bill is asking us to go back again, to throw us back on the old days when we are not going to have a fair and equal educational system in Mississippi. I assure you that there will be no changes brought forward that will be in any sort of hidden agenda. There is no trickery involved in this. If you wanted to redirect dollars to, to the classroom and you needed line item allocations, would you need to bring forward these code sections? If you wanted to uh, increase funding, would you, would you need these code sections? If you wanted to make certain that these dollars got to the classroom, you would need these code sections. And we're looking at ways to do that. The House voted for a bill that would permit uh, any doctor to provide a written excuse to exempt a child from being vaccinated. Right now, only the health department can approve exemptions, and that agency is against the change. Mississippi has the highest childhood vaccination rates in the nation. The House overwhelmingly gave its approval to create a Division of Child Protective Services. It would be a standalone agency, and its director, former Supreme Court Justice David Chandler, would report directly to the governor. The Olivia Y. lawsuit filed in 2004 exposed the state's failing foster care system. A settlement was reached to improve the system, but some of the proposed changes have not been made. The foster care system is responsible for nearly 5,000 children in Mississippi. Our legislators realize the posture that uh, our state is in pertaining to the foster care program, and they are determined, I believe, to an individual. They are determined to see that our foster children are properly cared for. The Senate and the House moved forward on bills to expand charter schools. The Senate version would enable oh, any students to switch I think school it's a lawyer that's trying to get attention. Charter schools uh, to open in C-rated school districts without local approval. 
The House version calls for allowing only students from D or F school districts to transfer to a charter school in another district. The Senate has approved the consolidation of two state agencies, Human Services and Rehabilitation Services, into the Medicaid program. The move could save millions of dollars, but it could also cost state jobs. The new agency would have no civil service protection for one year for jobs to be restructured or eliminated. And the House passed a bill that would use BP oil spill settlement money to repair roads and bridges throughout the state. Mississippi will receive millions of dollars from that settlement. The bill now goes to the Senate. The House voted against a measure to legalize marijuana. The vote came up unexpectedly when Representative Steve Holland offered an amendment aimed at reducing state prison costs during a debate over a bill to reconsider penalties for drug crimes. All of that leads us to the reporter's notebook. And Paul Boger of MPB News joins us now to talk about what's been going on at the Capitol, some of these issues we've already discussed. Paul, good to have you with us. Glad to be here. Uh, let's start with school consolidation. There's a lot of action this year on this topic and charter schools Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. You know, right now there's about 13 school districts around the state that are facing either elimination or, or consolidation. Um, they range from Holmes County and Durant to Winona, Chickasaw, and uh, Okolona. So there's, there's lots of different schools that are facing consolidation. And the main argument for it is these schools can't afford to operate on the local level. Essentially, the local taxpayers can't afford to keep these schools open. So one school district will be cheaper than two or three. Especially some of these much smaller districts that they, they right. think the economy of scale would be better. Exactly. Now, that's not the only consolidation bill. There's what's known as the Achievement School District. This is a new concept that's coming out of the Department of Education and a task force that was set up earlier this year that's going to look at consolidating con chronically failing school districts. So essentially take these 10, 15, possibly more school districts in the state that have shown that they, they've been failing for at least two years in a row and put them in one statewide district. So they would be in there until they were uh, showing signs of improvement for at least five consecutive years at a C rating, and then they'd be able to get out of the consolidation. So they'd be essentially under state control then in that statewide district? Well, they'll have their own private board and their own superintendent for the entire statewide district that will answer to the State Board of Education. So not necessarily under direct state control, but they would be their own separate entity. Uh, it is uh, it is a new concept, at least here in Mississippi, that uh, I don't remember us discussing before. Election reform on the first program of uh, first at issue of the season, we talked about a Secretary of State uh, Delbert mm -hmm. Hoseman's proposals. Some of them uh, are moving forward. Uh, some of them are moving forward. Others have died. Uh, the Senate's big omnibus bill looking at election reform actually uh, died on the calendar yesterday. They were able to take it up. We're not able to take it up. Excuse me. Uh, before the legislative deadline yesterday. Um, the House, however, passed three bills dealing with election reform. One was a big omnibus bill that would essentially go into the election code, look at different things like training poll workers, training uh, election workers, and then some campaign finance reform, uh, requiring candidates to itemize their credit card receipts. Going forward from there, you also have online voter registration. That was a separate bill and early voting. So. There is stuff moving forward. Uh, also, vaccinations. We've we've heard this in, in previous years, and there's some there's passionate debate typically on this topic because Mississippi, like we said at the top of the program, uh, is tops in the country as far as the mm -hmm. the number of children, the percentage of children who are vaccinated against contagious diseases. But there are some people who have very strong objections to their child being vaccinated vaccinated for various reasons. Right now, what this bill does, and it was probably the most heated debate I've seen in the House so far this year. Um, at least when they're moving forward, I should say, compared to last week. But this bill would essentially it re remove the requirement that the state health department has to approve physician exemptions from vaccinations. So a doctor can say, uh, little Jimmy here, has my, it, it, I approve little Jimmy not getting vaccinated, but then right. the state health department has to say, okay, we agree or we disagree. Because there are legitimate children, or there are, excuse me, there are children who are legitimately uh, allergic to shots, have uh, medical reasons for not getting vaccinated. Now, this wouldn't just outright create uh, philosophical or religious exemptions. However, it would give some kind of outlet for parents to, to if, if they believe that their child cannot be uh, vaccinated for a medical reason, they'll no longer have to have the state come in. They can have their family physician sign off on it and that would be it. And the health department wouldn't have any involvement and the health department's against this. Absolutely against it. They would, you know, they believe it's a slippery slope to philosophical and religious exemptions. Um, 
they believe it'll be a slippery slope to doctor shopping. So a lot of concerns on their part. The idea being if you could find a doctor who will agree with your philosophy or your reasoning for your child not getting mm -hmm. vaccinated, you could convince them to sign it for you and then you don't have to worry about the health department not approving. Right, and it's my understanding that a lot of these exemptions or denials for exemptions that have take pla taken place by the, the health department have been because they come from doctors that are out of state, mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that. This bill would allow, uh, it's my understanding, this bill would allow uh, parents to go to any doctor in the United States and get an, get an exemption. And that's the language that some are concerned about, that it's any doctor. Right. And what's the status of that bill right now? That's moving on to the Senate right now. It just passed the House this week. So we'll look forward in the uh, the House Education, maybe House, or excuse me, the Senate Education, Senate Public Health. All right, less than 30 seconds left. Any predictions for next <laughs> week, what we're going to see? Well, next week we're going to start looking at expenditure and revenue bills. So. We've been hearing about what's going on, you know, this, this budget deficit, problems with the state collecting money. This is going to be the first snapshot of what's really going on under the, under the hood of the state's finances. So we'll get to at least see the first couple steps in the, the budget process. All right, very good. Paul Boger, we'll see you again next week. Thank you. Thank you. A Mississippi attorney has filed a lawsuit against Governor Bryant over the state flag. Carlos Moore, an attorney from Grenada, filed the suit in federal court earlier this week. In it, he claims the state flag is state-sanctioned hate speech. Moore wants a judge to rule the flag unconstitutional and have it taken down. State Attorney General Jim Hood says he will defend the lawsuit despite his belief that the flag should be changed. We spoke with him and Governor Bryant about the lawsuit. Oh, I think it's a frivolous lawsuit. I think it's a lawyer that's trying to get attention. Uh, he's done that. We're talking about it now. Um, he, he has filed, I, I think, an inaccurate lawsuit because he's asked the governor to provide remedy that the governor cannot provide. I cannot issue some executive order and bring down the state flag. It is in the state code. The legislature would either have to move or there have to be a referendum. So his remedy of trying to get somehow to hold the governor responsible for removing the state flag is just... Uh, uh, irresponsible. The state of Georgia had the same issue and the 11th Circuit uh, upheld the dismissal of that case and uh, we suspect that probably, probably would be something that we would be raising before the district court and, and the 5th Circuit if necessary. We were unable to get in contact with Carlos Moore for his comments on the suit. Here is what some of you are saying about the state flag lawsuit on our Facebook page. Ethan Grisham says, while I think we do need a new flag, I'm fairly certain the governor's correct in this case. Any action on the issue has to come from the legislative level, and superfluous legal gestures like this may only hurt sentiment towards change among non-diehards. Debbie Brown says, the flag does not cause racism, people do. So what they are saying is, if we change the flag, racism will stop. So with all the car accidents and people being killed by them, why don't we ban all vehicles? Then we can ban guns, boats, motorcycles, bikes, baby beds, etc. Anything that causes death or unrest. Stupid. Mississippi's presidential primary just days away on March 8th, but voters in several other states have already made their choices. Here's how the delegate count is shaping up thus far. On the Democratic side, Hillary Clinton has a sizable lead on Bernie Sanders. Clinton currently has more delegates pledged, which hinge on state primary vote count. And superdelegates who can back any candidate. 2,383 delegates are needed to win the nomination. Mississippi has 36 Democratic delegates up for grabs. Neither of the Democratic candidates is expected to campaign in Mississippi before Tuesday's primary. Former President Bill Clinton, though, was in Jackson campaigning for his wife on Thursday. He first stopped in the Fondren area, where he met supporters who packed a coffee shop there. He then headed to speak to students at Jackson State University before heading to Louisiana. President Clinton says his wife's campaign is gaining momentum from a diverse group of voters. I think now... You know that we're getting into these primaries. You saw it in Nevada, where we had a diverse group of Americans give her a victory that a lot of people didn't think she'd win. And then she got the crushing victory in South Carolina, where she got a majority of white voters as well as a big majority of African American voters. On the Republican side, Donald Trump is in front of Ted Cruz by about 100 delegates. Marco Rubio is third, John Kasich fourth. Ben Carson signaled the end of his candidacy after a poor Super Tuesday showing. 
1,237 delegates are needed to win the Republican nomination. The group will be competing for 40 Republican delegates in Mississippi. Kasich spoke at a state GOP fundraising dinner at the Hilton Hotel in Jackson this week. Many state Republican lawmakers were there voicing support for the Ohio governor. He told the crowd he wants to create jobs, cut taxes, and balance the budget. What makes this country great is the strength that we have where we live, our families, our neighbors, our communities. And if we all slow down and realize we're all made special for a purpose of healing our world, the world in which we live, you take the success from people at the top who get people to rise and solve problems regardless of politics, and you add into that the spirit, the reignited spirit of Americans who know that they can rebuild where they live and make it a contagious element in our society where people are going to know that they need to live a life a little bit bigger than themselves. We do those two things and we'll shine up America. Donald Trump will make a campaign stop in Mississippi at Madison Central High School on Monday. Back in January, he visited Biloxi, where he repeated to the crowd that he wants to make America great again. We're going to straighten out our borders. We're going to straighten out our military. We're going to take care of our vets. We are going to make our country better than ever before. We're bringing back our jobs. We're going to make something really special. Ted Cruz will make a campaign stop in Mississippi the day before the primary. He will be at Jones County Community College in Ellisville on Monday. His event is scheduled for noon. So how does all of this matter to you? Let's get straight to the point with views from both sides of the aisle. Austin Barber is a Republican national strategist. He's the founding partner of Clearwater Group. Brandon Jones is a Democrat. He's an attorney with the Beria Jones Law Firm and a former member of the Mississippi House. Gentlemen, thank you, as always, for thank being you. here. Let's talk first about presidential uh, politics. Uh, Austin, one of the suggestions, uh, recommendations from the Secretary of State, like we talked about at the, at the beginning of the program, uh, was that Mississippi joined this so-called SEC primary with all these other states. We didn't do that, and yet we still have presidential candidates coming to Mississippi. Yeah, and I've been pretty outspoken myself, for whatever that matters. Uh, nothing against uh, Secretary Hoseman. He's done a great job and, and doing a lot of things, but I've just disagreed with him on this. I always thought it was better for Mississippi to be one of four states to vote on March the 8th. Mississippi, Michigan, Idaho, and Hawaii, I believe, are the four states, versus one of 13, and that's just proven to be true uh, where we've had Bill Clinton, former president, uh, was here for his wife's uh, campaign. Donald Trump, of course, will be here Monday. Kasich has been here twice in about 10 days, really working hard in Mississippi. And then, of course, Senator Cruz. And I think, yeah, I think either Sam Hall or Jeff Pender with the Clarion Ledger said Tate Reeves was the only person that was against uh, Mississippi not joining the Super Tuesday. Well, Tate Reeves deserves, deserves some credit here because he was right about this. Mississippi being one of four voting March 8th has been better for Mississippi's voters to get a chance to see presidential campaigns and candidates up close in person. It does seem like we're getting more attention than we typically get in a presidential election year. Well, the circus has come to town. I mean, this has been a, a wild one. It seems to get e wilder each week. And so I think all states could say this has been a little bit different. Which, it, it, which circus are you referring to exactly? Well, there's a particular Republican <laughs> circus. coming to Madison, that, Madison Central It Hospital. is. It's actually coming to my neighborhood. That's yeah. right. The, you, you're speaking of the Trump campaign. That's right. Yeah. We, you know, you used to be able to say, I think, pretty safely that if you wanted to teach children about civics, sit down, let's watch a presidential debate. You know, there are many clips of the old Kennedy-Nixon debate. It was a way for you to introduce young people into the process. I would not let my children within 100 yards of a GOP debate right now. That thing last night was unbelievable. And it seems to be getting more and more unbelievable. Clearly, Donald Trump has had his effect on this primary. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, um, not of what the outcome is going to be uh, in Mississippi on Tuesday. I think the Y'all Politics website had a poll out that had Trump at 41, Cruz was at 17, Rubio 16, Kasich 8, and now, of course, Carson's gone, and he had 5% of the vote share. That will probably, I don't know where it'll go. Um, Trump's going to win Mississippi. There's, there's no shocking news with that. But it's interesting to see, will his number go up? Will he resemble more of what he did in Alabama and Georgia? Uh, or will Cruz begin to make comeback? Cruz is fighting in Mississippi. Rubio has decided he's got to go fight for his political life in Florida and spending most of his time there. 
Um, but it'll be interesting to see uh, ultimately what Trump gets in Mississippi on Tuesday night. We've been an outlier. Tell me if I'm wrong, but in a few of these recent primaries where, for example, four years ago, Just Santorum off. and I guess when we were going into this season, I, I sort of suspected that Cruz might have an advantage, but... Yeah, well, I mean, look, nobody could predict what Donald Trump was going to do in the popularity. Yeah. And look, he has, you know, tens of thousands um, of supporters in Mississippi, no question about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we have been a little bit of an outlier. And in 2012, of course, I was a part of the Romney campaign. It was essentially a kind of a three-way tie for first. Uh, Santorum, Gingrich, and then and then Mitt came in third, but it was very, very close. Yeah. Uh, it, and you won't see that. Uh, you won't see that on Monday, but we'll have to see. I wonder if Rubio not coming to the state, Wilson, is going to hurt him, or will he be able to try to stay close with Cruz uh, for second place? It'll be the, sort of one of the things to watch for on election night. Austin, you're plugged into Republicans on the national level. What kind of damage is Donald Trump doing to the Republican Party on the national level? Well, I'm no fan of Donald Trump, but I'm, and I'm going to try to put that bias to the side here. I think what he is saying is, is that he's bringing independents and sort of, as they might, he may want to call them Reagan Democrats, back to the Republican Party right now. But what he is doing is, and, and he'll say that's a positive. People like me, on the other hand, would say he is just dividing and blowing up our party. I've worked for this Republican Party, I'm 40 years old my whole life, working with my father in the Mississippi Delta, as I said the other day, literally losing every election to Democrats, but working one campaign one year at a time to try to build uh, our party in Mississippi, which we've built a successful one. So I'm really worried about uh, the damage that he's doing um, to our party from a national level, but voters, it's up to the voters, and I, again, um, I say he'll win in Mississippi on Tuesday, but voters still have the opportunity to, to choose um, who they think is right. If they want to vote for him, you know, obviously that's their, their right to do it. If they want to make another statement and go with Cruz or go with Kasich or go with Rubio, then that's what they should do. You know, you said something pretty, I think, important. With demographic shifts and with presidential politics being what they have been over the last two cycles, I think there was a real need to find voters somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if Reagan Democrats is an animal that exists anymore, but I do think Trump has attracted some folks to the conversation. I don't know that I'm pleased with how they're dispatching themselves now that they're part of the conversation. I wonder about what their motivations are given what some of his message has been. But I think it is a peculiar moment because you have people like yourself and others who built this party who now are dealing with this unwieldy percentage of folks that certainly don't seem to be historically what I thought of as Republican orthodoxy people. I mean, they're re redefining in many ways what exactly this word conservative means. And I understand their anger. Look, you know, um, I, I'm mad too. I'm mad about the direction the country is in. 23% pop, you know, 23% approval rate about right, you know, right track versus wrong track. I'm on the 77% side on that. Let me just make that make that plain. I'm unhappy with what President Obama has done, but it's not just about President Obama. A lot of people are upset with with things that President Bush did, what the what, the, what a Republican-controlled Congress did or didn't do in their eyes, and I think that has what has those are the sort of the main variables of what has birthed. Um, Donald Trump into where he is today, but um, yeah, I, I think he's going to be the nominee. Uh, Marco Rubio needs to win Florida. John Kasich needs to win Ohio, and Ted Cruz needs to win some other states in order to keep this thing going. Um, but there's still a bit of a race. Unlike on the Democrat side, it looks like Hillary is 100% going to be the nominee. Uh, I, I, I assume you would feel the same way, and that she's going to win Mississippi probably pretty big. Yeah, it's a seven of the 11 states last week, pretty strong showing, and that Colorado race is actually tightening up as they count more votes. But I think the Massachusetts win was big for Clinton. I think there was an expectation that perhaps with Bernie bringing some new people into the dialogue. He was doing well in states like Massachusetts, so I thought that win was important. And the poll you mentioned shows uh, heavily, uh, the Democrats heavily favor Clinton here in Mississippi as well. Uh, Mitt Romney, the Republican nominee for president last time we did this, uh, said this week that if we elect Trump as the nominee, the Republican nominee, it ensures Hillary Clinton a victory uh, in November. Do you think that will be the case? I, I don't feel cocky about this. I mean, one of the things that Austin and I have talked about is Trump keeps exceeding expectations. I mean, we laughed him off months ago. We thought certainly something that he would say would change the tenor of the race, would change the dynamic. I never saw him getting to this point. I'm not going to argue for a minute that I expected to be where we are. And so given that, I think any Democratic 
you know, presidential candidate had better take him seriously, had better take the people who he's brought into the process seriously. I don't think it's going to be a cakewalk. But, you know, it's interesting. I, I was wondering what Governor Romney's speech, what impact it might have. I'm not so sure that in this hyper frustrated climate that a talk like that coming from a you know, so-called establishment candidate like him doesn't just make the Trump people dig in even more, given how interesting the dynamic is. No, I think it does. And look, I moved my family to Boston to work for Mitt Romney in 2012, and obviously I'm, I'm you know, a huge fan of his. And I thought that was, he needed to say what he, he said, and I don't think it, it moves a lot of people. But listen, I, I, fault the, I fault a lot of the Republican campaigns and candidates himself for where Donald Trump is. Ted Cruz hugged Donald Trump for weeks and weeks and weeks in July yeah. and August and September because he thought he was going to fall out. He, yeah. Just like you just said, he thought, well, Donald Trump's going to follow the race and I'll get all his supporters. Same, Marco Rubio, he didn't say a negative thing about Donald Trump until about three weeks ago. Now, I will say I was working with, with Governor Perry and then Governor Bush. Governor Perry gave a speech saying exactly what he thought, of course, Rick Perry from Texas, about Donald Trump in July of 15. And then Jeb Bush started at the end of 15. So, a lot of these guys who are trying to fight off Trump here at the end, they have nobody to blame but themselves. Has, has anybody negotiated the release of Governor Christie last seen transfixed standing behind Donald Trump at that very surreal press conference? You talk about a guy that has just been through a political odyssey, kind of emblematic of this cycle. Yeah. It's been so but, strange. And we'll have to leave it <laughs> at that, Brandon. Uh, Austin, thank you both thank for you joining much. us. This race will continue, of course. Mississippians will vote on Tuesday. We thank you for joining us on issue, at Issue. We'll see you again next week.